myself, I'm Matt Sump. I'm our Illinois and Iowa account executive. I also have on here Scott London, Devin Glass, and Rob Kresman, three of our applications engineers. So just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover, Scott's going to be up first, and he's going to go over some 3D toolpath options as far as controlling boundaries, a little bit on the toolpath filter. Devin's going to get into some more toolpath and selection tips as well as uh, some lathe tips as well. And then lastly, Rob will end the show, is going to do some 2D peel on a four-axis part tips, along with some how to utilize stock model, and touch a little bit on view sheets, which we always like to hammer home because they're such a useful tool. I am going to pass it over to Scott. So hi, everybody. My name's Scott London. I can see from the attendee list I've met a lot of you or in class or talked to you on the phone at least. And before I get started here, I do want to mention, I'm sure Matt has before, but uh, for classroom training, we've kind of converted it over to uh, webinar training, kind of like this. We can handle about four or five students at a time. Um, we can use uh, GoToMeeting to do the webinar, and at the same time, we start up GoToAssist, so I can actually see your screen if you're running two monitors. Uh, so that is an option if uh, you're still interested in doing that. Uh, taking a class during these times, you can get a hold of Kim Clapper and uh, she can get you registered for that. The schedule is up on the uh, our website, shopperinc.com. Um, it's the same schedule. It's always been, it's just that we're doing that stuff online. So anyway, to get started with this, I wanted to talk a little bit about the edge curves command, uh, the 2D, 3D switch, and uh, splines and lines and arcs. So right now I am in a, uh, what you call a uh, shaded outline view, which is, you know, this button down here, I'm sure you're all aware of. And that's what's showing those black edges. This is a solid model. So those are the edges of the solid model. That's not wireframe. If you turn on uh, shaded, you can see those, those edges kind of disappear. So anyway, on the wireframe tab, you have your, your edge curve commands, uh, curve on a single edge or curve on all edges. And this is common for creating containment boundaries. So if I was to say curve on all edges and just pick this single face, it's actually gonna end up creating a circular shape here and a triangular shape on the, on the edge. Those are considered the outer edges of that selected face. So when you hit end of selection, you can see there you have your your wireframe geometry there. And normally this is set to a five thou tolerance and for a solid model, that's fine. For a surface model, um, you may need to tighten that up or make that larger. That refers to gaps between edges, between surfaces. But normally it's on uh, keep both. In this case, it's not gonna make any difference. If there was a hole through this surface and you said inside only, it would only create a wireframe geometry on the hole. And if you said outside, well, then you'd get exactly what you have here, the two, the two perimeters. Furthermore, this is probably creating a combination of lines and arcs and splines. Uh, there is a toggle button down here to try and force it to go all arcs and all lines. Um, I have limited success with that. A silhouette boundary uh, option for that seems to work a lot better. But right now we're in 3D. So down on the bottom here, your 3D switch, you know, this is fine. You could use that as a containment boundary. Just so you know, if you flip it to 2D, it turns it into flat wireframe geometry. It's parallel to whatever plane you're currently in, the top plane. And right now it's at Z zero. So if you change this to one inch and hit enter, it's now one inch above Z zero. So it doesn't really matter where it's in Z, as you all you know, it's a containment boundary. So you can change that at any time. Um, some more to do with this. Let me okay that and undo it. If I was to say curve on all edges and pick say this face and this face and hit end of selection, and I'm gonna go back to 3D for a moment. I wanna talk about this one edge right here. That is what you call a shared edge between the two faces I selected. And you do have a choice down here to show that show the shared edges or not show them create them, I should say, create them or don't create them. Typically it's it's turned off, so you end up with all that wireframe. Uh, so there's just a couple of buttons in there. Um, let me undo that for a second. 
And you go back to 3D, up to here, end of selection. All right, so what do we have there? Well, if I go to statistics, which I added to my right-click menu here, uh, we got one arc and 36 splines. And you can also see that with your filters. If you say show uh, show only arcs, that's the only arc. So apparently all this other stuff are uh, splines. Just click that, turn it off. There's your splines. So that's about it for edge curves. I do want to talk a little bit about silhouette boundary as well. Um, I'm going to undo this. Silhouette boundary is kind of like curve on all edges in the 2D mode. It's going to project it to a flat plane, whatever your Z value is set to. So my Z value is currently at zero. So when I say silhouette boundary and create, oops, I forgot about that. Uh, with solid models, you're going to have to turn on your solid selection icons, make sure that you have only your face button on. I can pick just that face. And then I get some geometry up there. But is it splines or is it arcs? So if I go to statistics, I got 21 lines and 39 arcs, no splines. So I don't know if you noticed, I think there was an option in there that talks about arcs and or splines. Right here, it was told to fit arcs and I, I don't recall if that's the default or not, but if you go to splines, so we may have different results now. Why is this important? Um, we had a, a tech call the other day. It was kind of like gear teeth along a rack and they were using 2D dynamic mill with, uh, to rough it out. And uh, I forget how many teeth there were, 50, 60 teeth along it. And it was all splines. And the dynamic mill op was taking about 40 minutes to generate a toolpath. So what we did is we used silhouette boundary, uh, tightened up the tolerance and told it to create arcs. So it created all lines and arcs and got rid of the splines. And it then calculated in less than three minutes. I think it was about two and a half minutes on my computer. So, you know, if you only have a couple of splines, it's usually not a big deal, but there were actually hundreds and hundreds of splines. And that was slowing down the calculation quite a bit. So you may want to consider using silhouette boundary and trying that uh, arc option to make arcs rather than splines. All right, so the other part of this, uh, my presentation was to talk about um, um, arc filtering, which you're probably pretty much all familiar with. So we could talk about it in the 2D world and the 3D world. So I've got a dynamic opti rough. Now, although that's a 3D tool path, it's really, when it's all the cutting motion is 2D because it's at a constant Z as it's cutting. So right now I don't have any arc filtering turned on. This is 1,289 kilobytes. So in the arc filter menu, I did open up the tolerance to 3,000 for roughing because I'm leaving, I think, 20 or 30,000. As a general rule for roughing, you're going to want to make this value about 10 to 20% of the amount of stock you're leaving. I'm currently not using any arc filters. So, you know, most, most machines will handle that okay. I suppose if you have an older machine, older control, your motion can get kind of jerky because maybe the machine can't keep up with it. Could be read ahead from your, your CNC control, could be servo motor response time. So you can dumb down the G code a little bit instead of, because this is all little GO1s right now. So if you're having, machines having problems with that, you can always turn on your arc filtering. And the defaults are to create arcs in X and Y only. And that's fine because that's where our cutting motion is in X and Y. We're going to leave these defaults the way they are. One thing I will change, though, is this up here. So if you've been to my class, I've always said just set it to 50% and forget about it. And when you OK that, of course, it's going to go dirty. But when we regen this toolpath, instead of 1,289 kilobytes, it's going to become uh, considerably smaller. 170, as you can see there, it's 175 kilobytes. Uh, you can tweak it even more, but the gains you get now are not very significant. I, I might be able to get it down to, to 165 or something, uh, but that's really good enough. That's why I just say set it to 50 and leave it. 
Uh, you could try a smaller number on the cut, param, cut tolerance side, 15%. That'll give you 85% on the right side. Um, I'm going to OK that and regen. So instead of 175, it's going to be a little bit smaller, 159. So it's not a big increase. So, I mean, it's up to you. You can use any number between 50 and 15. Uh, but for roughing, I'd usually just use 50%. All right, so I have another part that uh, I was working with. So this one, I did a couple of waterline toolpaths. Um, they're kind of the same. Uh, let's see here, cut parameters. No, I'm sorry, arc filter. So this one, the default, when you start a toolpath, it's going to default to one thou total tolerance. And if you're not doing any arc filtering, that's not good enough. That's going to leave facets on your part. But as you can see here, I did use arc filtering, 15%. And a waterline toolpath is always at a constant Z while it's cutting. Therefore, you really only need arcs in X and Y. And I'm not using any smoothing settings at all over here. And that one's 350 kilobytes. Now, this next one's a little bigger in kilobytes, and I think what I did is I tightened up instead of uh, 1 thou total tolerance, I went down to 2 thou or 2 tenths of a thou total tolerance, again with the 15% arc filter. So it's considerably bigger, but this will produce a better surface finish. Now, sometimes in Verify, that's hard to see. Um, I believe. I have a couple of pictures down here. Let's see if I can get these called up. And you know, verify as you know, uh, because TV monitors, the pixels are about eight thousandths apart. It's sometimes hard to tell what you're really getting. But this picture on the left with the red markings, this was the one thou tolerance, and you can see some little. I'm just going to call them little divots. They're not gouges. It has not violated the part, but that one thousandths is a cord height tolerance, which is really too loose. So it's like diamonds of a facet ring. However, it did not violate your finished surface. And it also looks like it left a step here. By changing to the two tenths tolerance, and that's the only thing I changed, you can see on this one, those markings are not there anymore. So I know that's hard to see, but uh, just something you might want to look for in the future. So. Everybody's got questions on arc filters. Um, so I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but MasterCam Corporate did a uh, arc filter study a couple of years ago, actually. I think it was back in 2017 or 18. And they've got a real nice document and a part file to go with it out on the MasterCam website uh, on the Tech Exchange. Uh, let me find where I went with that um, PowerPoint. So this is a pretty long document, probably too much for this particular uh, webinar meeting. But I just want to point out that they cut the same part, I think, 28 different times. And as you poke through these, you'll notice that they are labeled. This is part number one. And this was a total tolerance of 1 thou with no arc filtering whatsoever. And you can just look through these pictures and you can kind of see the difference in surface finish. I've looked at these a lot. You really got to look at these close and you got to go over it many, many, many times. But as you go to the next one, now that looks much worse because they went to a total tolerance of 3,000. That's way too loose for finishing. You can see the faceting and other things going on. They also got um, a ranking here. Uh, they're ranking this seventh out of 28. And I believe this ranking is based on lines of output G-code. So number one would be the least amount of G-code. In this case, it ranked in seventh place. So as you mess with these filters, it's also going to change your machine runtime and your regeneration time. So you, you can look at these when you have some time to look more closely. But um, number nine was ranked, num uh, part number nine was ranked first. One, two. Seven. I don't know where nine is. But at any rate, uh, you can see here um, 
much cleaner. That's a one thou tolerance with 50% on your cut filter and arc filter. Uh, this one also has tighten lines turned on by 5%. There's another one in here without that, and it's very close to the same thing. So I know a lot of people probably haven't seen this, and, and this is pretty good. You just got to spend some time with it, and it'll at least it'll give you an idea so you don't have so much trial and error. As far as where you can find these things, um, let's see if I can call up uh, get something over here. You go out to mastercam.com. <clears throat> of course, you have to have an account. You'll have to log in. You can create an account for free. And then you can uh, link it to your uh, SIM. And if you have any issues connecting your account or setting up a customer Mastercam account, just contact our support staff and they can get the linking code for you and get you all set up. Yep. So up here on communities, I can go down to tech exchange and uh, for a keyword, I'm typing in arc filter and search it out. So uh, here's one, a more recent one, although this is really just talking about arc filtering for roughing. Um, this is the one right down here. So when you go into it, you can download um, right here. Here's the links. They didn't color them, so they're hard to find. Uh, this one here, results, this is that this, this Word doc, PDF doc that we're looking at right now. And then this one is the actual Mastercam part file that contains all those different tool paths and settings. So it's something you may wanna look at. Um, I found it to be helpful. Also, lastly, when you're in Mastercam, uh, hang on, I didn't wanna start that. Let's just go over here. When you're in Mastercam and you're on the arc filter page, don't forget that you can always go to the help button and I, if you haven't read through this stuff, I highly recommend you read this stuff. Now, before refinement, after refinement, this is this is talking about uh, either arc filtering and or the smoothing switch, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, also in that document I just showed you, there's some smoothing settings in there as well. This is just turning on smoothing and you can see the difference. Um, it's got something to do with how close the points are calculated to each other. And when they're real close to each other, the tool's kind of rubbing in the same area. So you get a little bit of tool flexion and, and you know extra cutting, and then just kind of smooths it out. But if you expand all these, and I'm not going to read through all of these, but you really should investigate these, uh, all of them, and then also go to parameters, and you can read all about you know the different settings that are in there. You don't use all these settings all the time, um, but this is uh, your best source for this type of information. So with that, I'm going to turn it over back to Matt, and he can get you guys uh, set up with the next. Uh, Hang on, results. Scott. We had we had one yeah. one quick question. I I think you can answer this better than me. What yeah. What what does the that slider mean between like right now? I believe it's 15 and 85 percent. Could could you summarize sliding that either way? Yeah, what, the, what that does. The, the slider bar they're connected. You know, so if, if this is at 95, the other one's going to be a five. If you type a value in 15 and hit enter, the other one will adjust appropriately. This one is called cut tolerance. This one is called filter tolerance, line arc filter tolerance. Um, you generally want the cut tolerance number smaller than the line arc filter. In every case I've ever seen, it's always smaller, never bigger. Um, and, you know, in layman's, I asked one time the software engineer what this was, and he went into a whole bunch of algorithms and mathematical equations, which is why I like that document that I just showed you. Uh, it, it definitely gives you an idea of what's going on. And it also applies to the smoothing. When you, uh, If I turn off arc filtering and go to smoothing, um, again, I can set this to 15. And, and this would be a typical setting 
15% and 85% when using smoothing. Now this would be for like a free form sculptural part where in some cases there might be some arcs and as you go down to the next depth cut, maybe it's no longer an arc, it's a spline, which is gonna convert the little points. So you really don't wanna use arc filtering in that case because you might have one depth of cut where it's an arc, the next depth of cut might be a spline with little geo ones and you might see a difference in finish. So a lot of times when I get into 3D sculptural, I'll use smoothing rather than line arc filtering. Um, some machines you can do both at the same time. It, it, it's really depend, highly dependent on the machine. Um, some lower end machines, I would not recommend doing both of those. Um, but if you've got a machine that you purchased with a bunch of high speed options for this kind of work, uh, you can sometimes get away with both. Um, but if you read through the, uh, the help files talking about down here, they mention that you may not want to use line arc filtering when you're doing a free from sculptural surface for the reason I mentioned. So that's uh, about the best answer I have for that. Rather, otherwise, we'd have to get a hold of the software engineer to get them to start talking about that. But it definitely affects your, your arcs, how many arcs you get. Um, smoothing just smooths out the point distribution. In the original calculation, some of the points might be bunched together because as it slices the part in X and Y, it's doing all this math. And then smoothing is going to redistribute them uh, so they go out you know, more smooth pattern. As far as these other options go, they're not used too often. Uh, you can read the help file about that. Um, if any of them are used, it's probably going to be uh, shift points randomly or minimize number of points. But I just try, I would suggest trying it this way first. And one other one other bit of information for you guys that have been using uh, Mastercam in older versions, if you go all the way back to X2 or X3, this page didn't exist. You had three buttons. It said one-to-one -one ratio, two-to-one, and three-to-one. So a one-to-one -one ratio is 50-50. And then a two-to-one ratio is roughly 33 and a third. 33 and a third on the left side, 66 on the right side. And then, of course, the three to one ratio is going to be about 25. Um, but back in those days, that's all they had was arc filtering. I don't think they had smoothing, if I remember right. So once smoothing came out, they kind of redid this whole interface. So anyway, uh, you can take it from there, Matt. Hope that answers that question. OK, yeah, and I'll, I'll just add add to that is that the the cut tolerance is how closely the tool is following the given geometry. And then the line arc tolerance is the amount of distance we're giving leeway to Mastercam to create those arcs and shorten up the code. Correct. So obviously the more you go towards the left-hand side, the more room you're giving it to create bigger arcs and lo more loosely follow the geometry. So like that 50-50 scenario you mentioned, that's gonna be typically more a roughing setting because you're you know leaving 20 or 50 thou a stock so you don't necessarily care how big of or how loosely it's following the geometry right. you're leaving plenty of room but what i'm going to do here is pass it over to devin well hello everyone thank you for coming out this my name is devin glass i'm an applications engineer for shopware you may have heard me over the phone or seen me in training in indiana or western kentucky um, today, I just want to talk about a few things, starting with something for pretty minor, um, but I find it very useful. And I, I, in my experience, I found not many people have ran into it. Um, and when searching for an application for this tool, I, I kind of kept coming back to this little side project I did for my father-in-law, where I was making a, a nameplate for a flag box of a, of a dearly departed uh, family member. And... Uh, <laughs> So I went ahead and re, re, uh, redid the letters because I, I respect their privacy. Um, and I wanted to show you the problem I ran into where I was engraving this nameplate on, uh, on my home CNC router I got, which uh, on all honesty, I'm not, uh, it's not the best <laughs> on the market. Um, but the problem I kept running into was I could not get the letters to cut even. The, the, the plate would try to flex and I could not get it perfectly flat. So I would have to do operation after operation, just kind of tuning it in, trying to get all the letters the same height. So for this example, let's say, you know, uh, this four and the W didn't come out to come out right. Well, how do I isolate those? Well, I can either try to 
shift click and basically select them piece by piece, but that can get a little troublesome. And uh, I'm not a huge fan of that. I could window around it. Whoop, I could window around it. But then I get more than I want because, you know, let's say this the wasn't a problem. That one came, those letters came out fine. It's just the W, the four, and this that didn't come out quite right. Well, there's an option we have in both chaining and in both just plain old selection called polygonal selection. And if you come up here, and this is how you do it outside of chaining, there's a selection method. And by default, it's set to automatic. You saw me a second ago using chain selection where I hold the shift key and I click on the letter and it just runs a chain around it. We're used to seeing window, but there's also polygon. And when I set this to polygon, you can see there's a little icon up here at the top. Whoop, my mouse was at the wrong spot. And what this allows me to do, or trying to draw a window like before, is it gives me a line. And once I get this started by holding and dragging, I can then move it to a position, click, move it to a position, click, move it to a position, click. And I'm literally drawing in the window so I can get nice deep in here. I could go around this four, I could go around this this. And when I got to a point where I like it, I'll double click it. And it grabs with everything in that polygon. So it's it's a very handy tool. I used it all, almost the entire day through that through that uh, situation. Um, but uh, that's how you get to the polygon selection when you're just playing with geometry, trying to move certain geometry or whatnot, and you there's a lot of other conflicting geometry you're trying to kind of weave weave around. Um, but if you wanted to do it for chaining, let me clear my selection. I'll just bring up a chaining dialog. So I'll go up to analyze chain because I don't have a machine loaded or anything. So uh, polygonal chaining is right here as well, right next to window chaining. So I can polygonal, do the same thing. And then it's gonna give me a sketch and approximate start point. And there we go. So, uh, you know, when trying to find applications for polygonal chaining, I, I find myself coming to it a lot. But when certain situations came up, this one was the one that I kept coming back to while uh, while uh, it's probably not the most relatable situation. But understand that you could use this with any piece of geometry, not necessarily engraving, not necessarily letters. It's just, in my experience, letters has always been the, the thing I'm bobbing and weaving trying to get around. But it could also be used for features and for getting geometries in a certain weird shape pocket that you don't want to get, say, this hole that would you would grab if you got a window square. Just another method of selection. So that's small things out of the way. We'll move on to uh, troubleshooting tool paths. Uh, so a uh, question I keep getting uh, when I'm when I'm taking tech calls is how how do I how do I troubleshoot like how do I how do I kind of look what do you do to figure out what's wrong with my part and uh, I kind of wanted to show this little feature that came out in uh, 2019 the previous version that has been a huge help for me not only as a tech support representative but more of a uh, as a instructor. So what I have right here is a dynamic OptiRough. Uh, this is actually one of our class files we talk about when we're doing 3D toolpathing. And one of the things we recommend people do is instead of going with your standard rapid retract moving to your new positions, we recommend going for a very, very fast feed move instead. So you'd be retracting at say 500 inches a minute, but it'll be a G1, so you don't have the problem of dog legged moves. And that's, a, that's another webinar. But anywho, uh, in this situation, uh, we ran into this problem where our whole toolpath is now blue. So I can't tell what is actually cutting and what is retract. Um, but in 2019, they introduced this new feature called advanced toolpath display, which has been pretty nice. And you can find it in two places. You can find it under the view tab right here. Or in the toolpath manager, you can find it right here, right next to display only associative. So if I turn this sucker on, now my toolpath has been color coded. You'll no excuse me, you'll notice that the cutting motion is still blue, which note all of this is customizable when it comes to color and size and all that good stuff. But you can see here now I have orange, that's my transition, my my uh, my back feed. I have green and red. Green would be my lead in, red would be my lead out. 
And we'd also see some other colors too, if it was present in this toolpath. But that's not the only thing that I really like about this, is the fact that we can specify what we wanna look at. So if I hit the little drop down right next to advanced toolpath display, you'll notice that there's checks around all these different movement styles. And let's say I wanna uncheck all the cutting motion. I get all that blue out of the way. Okay, let's say, let's, let's, let's think about this here. A situation where we know that when the tool leads into the part, it crashes or it gouges or what have you. So what if I know that it's struggling on the lead in or the lead out, I can come into this advanced toolpath display and basically uncheck everything that I know is not the issue. So get rid of the feed retract motion. Oop, didn't want to get rid of my entry motion. Get rid of exit motion. Then get rid of my transition motion. Get rid of my micro lift motion. And here we could see that I can see all my lead ins. Now that's great and all, but you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really help me just to see the see the tool path in this light. I mean, maybe if the motion was literally going into the model and was a little more obvious, then hey, yeah, then we're done here. But what I want to kind of transition to or segue into is my second or third tool uh, for this webinar is the advanced toolpath, uh, uh, analyze toolpath, my mistake. So under the home tab, there's this analyze toolpath, and you'll note that I also have it set in my right mouse click. So if I go to my analyze toolpath, normally by default, you don't really see anything. You just see an arrow, you know, you get some nice information like, is this a feed move? What's the feed rate? What's the spindle speed? What kind of, uh, what kind of G code is it pumping out? What is the coolant on? you know, all good information for this particular particular move. However, what I find the most useful is by turning on the display tool and maybe even the display holder. If I turn on display tool and you'll notice I have an opacity bar, well, what that allows me to do is I can move this tool, get it into a position where I think it might be colliding or having an issue, click. Now it's locked there. I can rotate the screen, see, oh, is that, no, it, it's far away from my wall because I have stock to leave and whatnot, but then I can rotate around, cross check it with the wall, make sure it's not gouging, get really up and close to it. Because before I found this, or <laughs> before I ran into this feature, or before I was shown this feature, I should say, uh, I would always do the back plot and then try to try to meander the back plot right where the crash is happening or the verify right where the crash is happening. I just could not get exactly where I wanted it. But this function just lets me literally go out, get really close to it, and wherever I click on that 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 uh, that move, it's going to lock it there, and that lets me rotate my screen, which is always kind of a uh, kind of hard to do, just to pinpoint that one spot I'm looking, excuse me, looking for. So that's the that's the tool I always tell people when I'm when I'm troubleshooting your guys' parts. That's the tool I keep running back to, and you may have seen me use it when we're, when I'm remoted on. Uh, to your systems because this this lets me immediately see where the where the problem area is and what could be causing the issue and see a, a visual representation of that tool. Alrighty. So a note: this also works for lathe turning tools. So if uh, if for whatever if for the reason you wanted to uh, analyze toolpath on a lathe tool, it would also work as well. All right. And now from the final, uh, <laughs> the final section here is for you get for you guys who are using lathe for C and Y axis, mainly Y axis turning or, or machining. I mean, or milling. Bleh, can't talk. So um, something we we really 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 stress in our classes is to get used to plane creation. You know, uh, if you want to machine on this back this back hexagon, you want to machine on that flat. We want to get you in the habit of making that plane from scratch. So going into the planes manager, hitting the green plus, or, or from geometry, then creating the plane on that face, then moving it back to the origin, making sure that the X is pointing towards the, the main spindle. You know, we, we want you to get in that habit because by learning how to create those planes from scratch, it prepares you for a lot more than the tool I'm about to show you. Um, the tool I'm about to show you is kind of an easy uh, shortcut that Mastercam came up with for just purely lathe, y-axis, and c-axis users. So 
uh, that shortcut is up here under the turning tab of when you pull in a lathe there's this c view button okay now i click on that c view button and note i have all these options here it says do i want a machine on the right face do i want a machine on the back face do i want a machine on the cross face and in this situation let's say i want to i want a machine on this back polygon here right here i want to like face it well that would be a cross so i'd switch it to cross mode I'd want it to be parallel to the construction, so I'll stick with parallel. And if I know the rotation I need right off the top of my head, I could type it in here, but you'll notice that I also have a select button. I click on select, and I just have to click on a line or an arc that is flat with that plane. So I'm gonna click on this line here, 120 degrees. Now, what if I'm not certain about that? What if uh, what if I don't trust that 120 degrees? Well, I can also click on display. And now we get a little wireframe uh, interpretation of what our tool would look like when it's approaching that part. So that definitely looks good. I'm gonna hit enter to get out of that little display there, get a different angle just so you guys can see. I'm gonna hit enter. I like what I got, so I'll hit the green check. And if I look over my planes manager, note, it created a plane. It didn't do me any favors by naming it anything special. So I might want to rename it to back X. And one other key point that I want you guys to know if you're using this tool is that it will change your C plane to that new plane you just created, but you also need to make sure you change your tool plane as well because those C and T planes should match in most situations. You could do that in the planes manager by clicking this T and make sure that the, the C and the T are matching, or you could come down here. You could see I have back hex as my C plane, the D plus Z plus as my tool plane. That needs to be under the named back hex. So we would definitely want those C and T's to match. And now that we have that plane created, I can go into the milling. I can do like a face. I will switch it to C plane. I'll chain around that sucker. Uh, go with a two inch face mill, that's fine. Skip to the cutting parameters, make this real simple just for demonstration purposes. Whoop. Green check. Now, normally I'd want to flip this face around, but it gets the it gets the idea across that you know plane creation for specifically Y and C axis can be a lot simplified because if I look at this plane a little bit closer, it's following all the rules that I've had that we tell you about in school, or uh, in school and training. Uh, it, we have the X axis pointing towards the main spindle for an upper turret lathe. We have the Z axis normal to the surface we wanting to cut or the perspective of the tool. Um, so. It's definitely a huge help there for people who struggle making the planes. Now, do I do, would I recommend just going with this from here on out and just skipping creating planes from scratch normally? My answer as a trainer is no. The main reason is by creating those planes from scratch, it's teaching you how to better apply yourself when you go into the more man or mill or bleh, milling focused avenues so if you're not on necessarily a y-axis slave you're on a rotary four axis or a five axis multi-axis machine plane creation is a very important tool but this is a shortcut for those who have some trouble or are needing to get a part on the on the on the machine that only focus on y and c axis but once again just a huge uh, huge help there but that's all i have i see there's a few questions that came in uh yeah, Devin, one one question on there. Um, I, I answered the one on analyze tool path because that'll work for turning or milling. But then John asked, does the C view work for angled holes? And I would think no, you would need to manually set a plane because they're like predefined views. Is that right? Um, so I guess the question is, uh, what would you detect what would you define as an angled hole would that be if like say for instance these holes are lined up with uh let me go into the g view yeah like say so these holes say those are like 15 degrees angled towards the face of the part 
it would not work no because the c view the c view uh tool only rotates around the lathe z axis so it's a very simplified method so it wouldn't take into account that tilt because if you if you go back in the c view you note that we only have one definition we only have one rotary we can define and that's okay. the c yeah that makes sense and then one quick question from Chris is, can you briefly explain why Z-axis does not line up with the actual Z-axis of the machine? Okay, um, I believe I have the answer for that one. Uh, so that's that goes back to a very, very old question about uh, back when Mastercam first came about. So when Mastercam first was designed and was uh, was programmed, it was mainly a mill product. And then as time went on, the lathe product got brought in. So in order for the lathe product to work as it is, it was hard coded back a long time ago to function as a function as a lathe. So you can see here that since my I'm using D plus Z plus, technically that is what I would be used to as a lathe programmer. But in Mastercam, where that's only at works as a display, we're taking the perspective and kind of uh, programming this lathe to almost think like a mill in the in the deep hard coded modes. So if I said on this D plus Z plus uh, here, and then I well I'm sorry, let me switch my WCS here. This is how Mastercam is used to seeing, you know, the X, Y, and Z plane. But for lays, the X becomes the Z and the Z becomes the X or uh, and flips this all around. And when we're creating milling planes, we're basically taking the perspective of the turret uh, because on a standard slant bed lathe, you got to think of the turret coming in from behind the part. So therefore you have to stand behind the tool or behind the turret to imagine we're turning that turret into a mill of sorts so we need to have that new updated axis so you have your x-axis pointing towards the main spindle because you're now standing behind the machine the z-axis is aligned with your tool that's coming in and then the y is kind of wherever uh, it follows dependent on wherever those x and z's are um, as for why uh, why the x and z does not match with the with the uh, what we're used to seeing in a lathe environment, that goes way back to how Mastercam was originally hardwired, and it's just how all the machines have been kind of configured. So we have the power to dis change the display, but when we go into plane creation, uh, it's very important that we understand that you know just because one display shows DZ, it may actually be a mill plane with uh, with the axes. Uh, change display for simplicity um, but we got to keep that in mind that when we're creating a milling plane that you know we can take say top and rotate that around and that gets us a basic top turret lathe i hope that answers your question if not feel free to reach out and i can i can go a little more in, in detail okay got the okay all right thanks a lot Devin. We'll give you a virtual round of applause there. And now I'm gonna switch it over to Rob of M Wisconsin. Hey everybody, uh, Rob Kreisman here. Uh, some of you might remember me from the uh, uh, rollout in Wisconsin at WCTC. I did a little tips and tricks presentation there. Of course I had pants on then, but anyways, enough about me. Uh, what I'm gonna demonstrate here is a, a 2D uh, dynamic peel toolpath on my fourth axis part. So first thing we have to do, notice when I imported this part here, uh, it's uh, not on zero, so I wanna align my part to zero first. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go into model prep. Model prep here, there's a tool in here starting from Mastercam 2019 that says align to Z. So I'm gonna click on that and I'm going to, it says select solid, to center on the Z axis. So I'm gonna select this right there. And it brings up that little gnomon, and you can use this to align your, your uh, part if you want, or you can just uh, leave it at zero. Just type in zero there. But, oh, I'm gonna go back and do that again here. I want to, uh, I wanna redo that. 
align to Z. I'm going to pick this again and align that. But I want to transform to plane, and I want to tell it to go to my top plane. So I'm going to transform it to my top plane. I don't want to create a custom plane. So I'm going to transform it to my top plane, but I also want my Z on the other end. So I'm going to switch my Z orientation here. So that aligns it and everything like that that I want. So I'm going to green check out of here and say, OK. Now you notice it aligned my part to my top view, which we told it to do. You see everything's equal there. So now I can go in and start creating my geometry for my toolpath. So the next thing we're going to do is create some edge curves. We're going to go to wireframe, and I'm going to go to curve on edge. Uh, first thing I want to do is a little trick here that I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to create some levels. I'm going to do that right in here. I'm going to go uh, number three, space, colon, and say uh, wireframe, unroll, enter. And I'm also going to create another level here, two, space, colon, and say edge curves. So if you notice, just by doing that right in there, I look at my levels, and you see that created them right there. So that's a pretty cool trick right there. So anyways, I'm going to go in, and my edge curves uh, level is active. I'm going to go and say uh, wireframe curve on one edge. I'm going to pick this edge here this edge there, roll that around and select this edge, and the green check out. Uh-oh, I forgot to do one here. So the next trick I'm gonna do is press my space bar, and that brings me back into my last function. I can say curve on edge, I wanna do this edge as well. So that's another trick right there. So there's my edge curves, right click and say top. Now, if I go to my tool pass and I want to do a 2D peel on here, dynamic peel, it's not going to let me. It's going to yell at me. It's going to flip me off. It's going to say, you can't do that. So I'm going to say, if I try it, it's going to say 2D peel. I'm going to pick my edges and there, there. And it's going to say overlapping, whatever. It's just not going to let me do it. It's going to come up in, with an error. So what we have to do is we have to create that geometry flat. So how do we do that? We're gonna go into transform. We are going to select the roll function and it says select chains. So we're gonna select our chain right here and it picks our whole chain there. we we'll say, okay. And <clears throat> I'm gonna go to our top view here and it brings out it flattens, it unrolls, we selected unroll over here. So it selects this and it unrolls that geometry. Now, what I wanna do here is go counterclockwise like that. And if I go to my right view here, or my left view, I should say, this shows where my tool path is. Now I have, I have to do something here to make this work. I don't want my tool to start right there. I want it to start over here somewhere. So what we have to do is rotate this around. Now I'll show you what this will do, and then I'll come back and do it again. So we're gonna just okay this. And now I can go in here and select my chains. I'm gonna select this one like that. And in a peel mill, you have to select two chains and it has to be the same direction start point being the same in there. So now if I say, okay, there's my two chains. And what we have to do in here now is go into our tool pass. Well, we'll just regenerate that right now and take a look. So you'll see there's our tool, our peel tool path, but we have to wrap it around that part. So we're gonna go in here, we have a tool, we have our parameters set, uh, linking parameters are okay, everything's in incremental, but we have to go into our rotary axis control and use axis sub. So we're substituting our y-axis, excuse me, 
and <clears throat> we're gonna rotate that around. Now we need a rotary diameter here. So I don't know what that is. So I can right click in this value box and say diameter of an arc and select that arc and it tells me it's one inch. So now I'm gonna hit okay and regen that. And you'll see there's our toolpath, but it is overlapping into that thin uh, blade there that we don't want that, okay? So that's why I said we had to do something different here. So we're gonna go back and I'm gonna go back and just reopen this. And we'll go through that real quick again. We're gonna go to model prep, align Z. And we're gonna pick that right there. Transform to plane, little review. Okay, we wanna change our Z to the other side. Typically your rotary axis is on the right side. We say, okay, we're going to create our edge curves again. Uh, we don't have our levels anymore, but we can, once again, we can go in here and say, do it the old fashioned way and say uh, edge curves. Okay, make that our active level. And we'll go on the wireframe, curve on one edge, there, 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 and there. So this time when we unroll, we're going to go to transform, roll, and we have it set to unroll. It's asking for a chain. Okay, we're gonna say okay there. Now remembered our settings of counterclockwise, but now this time we're going to rotate this to 270. Remember we wanted our start point over here. Okay, so now it, what it did was take that geometry and rotate it down in a 2D mode. So now we can take this and say, all right, we're gonna go to our tool paths, do a 2D uh, peel. Select this guy, that guy there, remembering to set to start on the same direction, same end every time. Grab our tool, everything else should be the same here. And we're gonna go to our rotary axis and say axis sub. And we know that this is one inch from before. And there's our tool path, which is centered and milling that uh, floor. So now you can see I have my geometry here and I have my levels set for edge curves and I wanna create another level, which is unrolled geometry. And I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna use my quick mass here to, uh, to select that. So I wanna take, I know that this was transform so it's it's purple that's the result color so i can just go right to my quick mask i urge you guys to really get to know these quick masks because they really help a lot i can say grab my result and change my level to the active level which is number three right now and now i can go to my part model and i can turn that off <clears throat> so now we have our toolpath here and if we back plot that, we can say, all right, that looks pretty good. Yeah, it looks good like that, going through kind of quick. But so we can go into back plot here. And if we want to simulate that rotary axis, we'll slow that down a little bit. Simulate that rotary axis, we can go into the settings here, our options, and go to simulate rotary axis and actually see that moving. So now you'll notice that the part itself, well, let's start that over. The part itself is moving to kind of simulate what you'd see on the machine. So that looks pretty good. It's nice and centered. I like what I'm seeing. So we're good there, I'd let this go. But now another trick I'm gonna do here is create a stock model because I, I like to see it removing material. I don't just like 
the back plot is great and everything like that tells me what the tool's doing, but I do like to see it removing material. So I'm going to go into my tool pass and create a stock model. Okay, so under stock model, okay, in Mastercam 2020, you have to give it a name. Uh, 2021 is an upgrade that gives it a name for you, which is a cool function because uh, those of you guys that use this know that uh, yells at you if you don't put a name in there. So we'll just call it one uh, model. And you can change colors here. I like to give it a little different color. I'm, I'm a flashier kind of guy. So, uh, and what I'm gonna do is select model here and I'm gonna select the model. Okay. Now I could just let this go and watch it uh, sim uh, verify on the model. But what I'm gonna do here is add some stock to it. And we're gonna say 20 thou. What that's gonna do is add stock to my model when I verify this. So there's my stock model. It puffed everything up 20 thou. So now when I verify, I can use this stock model. I can set it instead of stock setup, I can set stock model. There's my stock model and say, okay. Now when I go to verify, which one of the other tricks there is, uh, if you left click on your tool path here, that takes you in the back plot. If you right click on it, takes you into verify. That's another trick, a couple tricks along the way here. So there's my part showing my stock model. And now I can verify this and I'll just turn this down a little bit and watch it removing material. You can see it removing that 20 thou that I added to it. And that's pretty cool. That, instead of making a big block from a stock setup, you know, we had to, uh, this part was already roughed out. We're just looking at the finish path on the floor. So this is going to give me a pretty good view of my tool path. And I'll show you another trick after when this is done. Speed that up a little bit. We see it's cutting really good. And that is a 2D peel on a fourth axis part. And everything looks really good here, maybe except right there. So, but I can go into, into the verify tab up here and go into compare. And I can use the compare function to compare my model to my toolpath. So I'm gonna go into compare, and you'll notice that there's a tolerance here. Well, my tolerance is based on two thou, plus or minus two thou, which, so in other words, if everything comes out green, I'm plus or minus two thou. Now, I know what you're thinking, we get closer than that, we cut closer than that, but as far as the pixels goes, I think Scott mentioned pixels before, this is all we recommend for the verify option is to get within 2,000. How do you change that tolerance? Because I think by default, it's plus or minus 10. So we go into here and say 2,000, and that will update all these colors to be a different tolerance. So I think by default, it's 10. So if I put 10 in there, this is what it's gonna look like. You can see, so green would be plus, minus 10, plus 10. Well, we want it a little closer than that. So we're gonna say two. That's all we recommend. So now when I do this, I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna refresh this, and now it's gonna do its compare, and it's gonna show me where there's stock left and where it's finished. If everything's correct, you'll see all blue because that's plus stock, and green is finished. So you see the floor looks really good. On radius parts, you will see some streaking there, but that, that's pretty normal but you'll notice there I got a little bit of extra stock right there. So this compare function works really well for looking at extra stock. So now I can go back into my tool path and say, well, maybe I can extend that out in my cut parameters and extend that out, you know, 0.3, and that's gonna extend my end of my tool path out to clean up that area. <clears throat> you'll see it went 
further past and I can just tell by what my toolpath looks like that that's going to finish up real nice. So that's how you do a 2D, 2D peel dynamic toolpath on a fourth axis rotary part, which I think is pretty cool. This would be normally uh, a part that you would use a multi-axis on, but not everybody has that. So, you know, you know, I recommend thinking outside the box. And, you know, usually if you're, and I say this when I'm on site a lot, if you're asking if MasterCam can do it, usually it can. You just got to find a way. But that's uh, that's that toolpath there. Now, I, I was going to talk about some view sheets. And <clears throat> view sheets are really kind of cool thing in MasterCam. Uh, they usually reside right down here on your main screen. If you only have one screen, you know, and you're going back to your levels all the time or back to your planes, you know, it's kind of uh, redundant. But you can set up view sheets to um, make it a one-click operation to go to a different plane and a different level. And if your view sheets aren't on, you can go to the view tab up here and turn them on right here. You'll notice there they go on and off. So I'm going to set up a view sheet here with, uh, we'll say, you know, isometric view. This is how I like to save my parts. I like to go to isometric, and I like to save that main view sheet just like that. So I'm going to right-click on there and say Save View Sheet Bookmark. Okay, notice all the geometry is turned off. It's just the part in an isometric plane. Isometric. Let's see, I go like this, and if I click on that, we're going to go isometric here, save that, and we go back to that. It should come back, and it's not working. <laughs> we'll make another one here, and we'll say top. Uh, Name it. Rob, go try ahead. double click Rob, on the tab. Double click on main view sheet. Okay, gotcha. See, there you go. I even learned something. It, it used to be just clicking on it once, but now. Now, uh, <clears throat> MasterCam, you have to double click on it. So now there's my top view sheet, and I can set that to my view. And I can also go to my levels and add my edge curves to that. Okay, so now I can say, I can right click that and save view sheet bookmark. So now when I go to my main view sheet, there you can see it turned off that point, that level and went to that view. And if I click this one, it goes back to my top view and adds that level. So that's how view sheets work. Uh, when I used to program in a horizontal world where you have your WC, uh, WCS as your top and then all your custom planes down here and stuff, you'd have to go back and change that. Or if you right click, you, it, it just didn't work. So making view sheets you know, for every plane you have really is a cool, cool function. So <clears throat> that's kind of all I got. I mean, I do have more stuff, obviously, but I don't know what kind of time we have. But uh, it looks like we're running a little bit late here. So, Matt, yeah. what do you? We're, we're a little bit over. Um, we, we do have a question. Do stock models work with 3D finishing tool paths? Like for hard milling, will it recognize extra areas that have extra stock? And, yeah, the short answer there is yes. That's, you know, typically the... The most used example I would see of stock models is when people's do when people are doing 3D tool pathing is you can essentially do a stock model after each tool path or after a couple tool paths and then start even using the compare function in there to start recognizing where you have extra stock. And then some of the 3D tool paths like Waterline and I'm, the tech guys might be able to say which ones well, can do it or not, but you can essentially assign a maximum stock engagement to that stock model so that so that you're mm -hmm. not, you know, burying a small finishing tool in into a lot of material. Well yeah, I mean the the main the main function of the stock model is obviously to see your progress as you go in 3D tool pass and stuff like that. It works really well. You can also use that stock model for rest rest material as well once you're in the 3D roughing. So, that, I mean, that's one of the main purposes that I've seen for the stock model. The function I showed is just for a, a visual verify. Um, some people, you know, 
might not know that you can add stock to it and use it as a verify function. So that's why I wanted to show that. If you're a 3D programmer, you um, you probably are aware that you can use stock model as rest material and stuff like that. So, but yes, you can you can create uh, surfaces in certain areas and just create a stock model of that little surface and use that as a toolpath or as a rest rough material. So there's a lot of functions uh, that you can use the stock model for. Hopefully that answers uh, your question. Um, any other questions from anybody out there? Um, I see somebody mentioned that uh, it's all about saving clicks, uh, Walter. <laughs> yes, that's one of my uh, one of my sayings is you know using using the view sheets especially. If you can save clicks, uh, you're going to need them later. That concludes the formal part of the webinar here. So I'm I think we're getting a lot of co questions about my layout on my uh, Mastercam screen here. <laughs> oh, yeah, here, let me switch the presenter back to you, Devin, and we can talk about that. Because, yeah, a lot of people, I don't think, realize how customizable the interface is in Mastercam, even with, like, that dark theme that you run. Um, I, I I was going to mention this during the, the thing, but I thought it would just be like, hey, just know you can't do this. I am not the originator of this layout. I saw this layout one time during one of our company meets, one of our one of the uh, head honchos and master cam had this layout and I just got uh, super envious and I had to use it. But um, yes, you can move your managers around uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty much anywhere you want. So let me kind of get this back to a default setting here. Um, something you guys are probably used to seeing. Uh, da, 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 da. And real quick, I'll just switch it back to the regular theme here. Um, so this is what you guys are probably used to seeing, other than the green ribbon. So the first thing I like to do is I like to I like to make my uh, UI a little darker, just because uh, I don't know. I got this uh, paranoia that it's going to be easier on my eyes, and I'm going to go blind if I keep staring at bright white screens. So I switch it to dark gray <clears throat> in the options there file options and then options again theme dark gray you got that large icons button there too that a lot of people i think don't yep, know yep. About. so for yeah so for teaching uh I, I use large icons and for those who have uh some trouble seeing uh if you turn on this large icons if you take a look at your toolpaths manager here i'll turn it on uh okay it makes it a little bit bigger but you might want to stretch that out so these icons are a little bit bigger throughout the entire all the managers. So how I got both of them open at the same time is uh, you guys have probably ran into this by accident. I know I've had uh, students run into this by accident all the time, where if you grab, say, this entire top bar, note, it grabs all your managers that are connected to this, and this is now floating. Um, so I can move this around wherever you want. Uh, a lot of times I see uh, people put this on a separate screen our monitor so they can have this open at all times and have the entire screen to the part. And if I ever need to dock it back, you'll notice if I drag this around, icons show up on my screen. So I can dock it. If I hover over here, it'll give me a little highlighted display. I'll I'm let go. But if I want to move a specific manager, I can click and drag the manager from down here, like the planes, drag it off of there, rip it out, and then I dock it to the right. And then to get the levels how I want it, I click and drag the levels out of there. And note, I can I could dock it to the right here too, but notice it puts them side by side, which is not my preferred. Um, so what I can do here is if I hover over this manager, another set of icons show up, and I can actually dock it below. And then you can see here we got these uh, tools and these uh, buttons that kind of uh, object or get in the way. So I can turn those off by hiding the plane manager properties and hiding the level properties. And that way, when I'm modeling, I can have my solids opening, levels, planes, and when I'm toolpathing, I can have my toolpath manager, solids and planes, and just kind of work in between here. Um, and you can you can play around with these all you want. You can like say, dock this up here if you wanted, or dock it below if you wanted. So it's very customizable in that, in that situation. And you can also pin them too. So there's this little pin icon where It'll pin to the side, and you can just click on the tab, and then when you click back on your screen, it goes away. So that's usually my configuration.
And once again, I am not the originator. I'm copying somebody else that I unfortunately cannot remember his name. So don't don't give me credit. I thanks. just uh, thanks, Devin. <laughs> thanks to all the shopware guys. We have kind of a tri a triangle of the Midwest states going here. Devin's down in Indiana. Rob's up in Wisconsin. Scott and I are here in Illinois. And the beauty of the internet, we could all come come together and hopefully provide you guys some useful information today. So thanks again. And hopefully we'll see you all guys in person here soon.